And thank you all for, for coming here today. Thank you all again for uh, also finding the, the correct entrance. I know that there's been some confusion out with the front. Uh, so we're gonna be having some people still trickling in from outside. Uh, but hello, my name is Caroline Rose. I am the head of the Power Vacuums program at the New Lines Institute for Strategy and Policy. And I'm very, very grateful to have you all here with us today to discuss the trajectory of US-Kazakhstan relations. It's a very exciting moment to have this event as the New Lines Institute continues to deepen its focus on human security and actors and US interests in Central Asia amidst a series of significant challenges there. Of course, we are dealing with a number of uh, issues and, and, and topics that are challenging US interests in the region. We have heavy geopolitical crosswinds blowing at Central Asian nations from different directions. Russian war, the Russian war in Ukraine, US-China uh, US rivalry he heating up, and Taliban Talibanized Afghanistan. All of these external challenges come at the same time that the, this country is in the throes of a major domestic political economic transformation and pose a major stress test of the multi-vector foreign policy doctrine of Nur Sultan, as well as U.S.-Kazakh relations. I'd like to let our audience members know that this event, while not live streamed, is recorded and on the record. There will be a short 15-minute Q&A session for audience members at the end of this discussion, and we welcome audience members to participate. But of course, before I proceed with my own questions, I'd love to introduce our all-star panel with, here with us today. First, of course, we have Ms. Brienne Todd, a country director for Central Asia at the Department of Defense's Office of the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Central Asia. And she is an adjunct professor at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. Previously, Ms. Todd served as an assistant professor of Central Asian Studies at the Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies at the National Defense University, where she focused on transnational threats and regional security issues in Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Tur Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. We also, of course, have with us Ms. Lisa Curtis. Ms. Curtis is a senior fellow and director of the Indo-Pacific Security Program at CNAS. She's a foreign policy and national security expert with over 20 years of service in US government, including roles as deputy assistant to the president and the National Security Council senior director for South Asia and Central Asia, a professional staff member on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, where she handled South Asia, the, the South Asia portfolio for former chairman, Senator Richard Lugar, a senior advisor on the South Asia, in the South Asia Bureau at the State Department for India-Pakistan Relations, and a senior analyst at the CIA. Ms. Curtis also served as a senior fellow on, for South Asia at the Heritage Foundation from 2006 to 2017. Next, of course, we have Dr. Margarita Asanova, a senior fellow at the Jamestown Foundation with a key focus on political and energy security developments in the Balkans and Central Asia. Dr. Asanova is a recipient of the John Knight Professional Journalism Fellowship at Stanford University for her reporting on nationalism in the Balkans. She has authored several books on security, energy, and democracy, such as Eurasian Disunion, Russia's Vulnerable Flanks, and a critical study on Russian subversion in Europe, Eurasia, and Central Asia, and Azerbaijan. Next, of course, we have Mr. Eugene Chavosky, a senior analyst and program head for training and analytical products at New Lines, where he is a resident expert on international connectivity issues, security challenges, and geopolitics across Eurasia. He previously served as the senior Eurasia analyst at the geopolitical intelligence firm Stratfor for more than 10 years, where he focused on political, economic, and security issues pertaining to Russia, Eurasia, and China. He lectures on the geopolitics of Central Asia at the U.S. Department of State's Foreign Service Institute. Last but not least, we have Dr. Kamran Bakari, the Director of Analytical Development at the New Lines Institute for Strategy and Policy in Washington, D.C. Dr. Bakari is also a National Security and Foreign Policy Specialist at the University of Ottawa's Professional Development Institute and serves as the Coordinator for Central Asia Studies at the U.S. Department of State's Foreign Service Institute with 15 years of experience in the private sector intelligence space, during which he provided intellectual leadership in the publishing of cutting-edge geopolitical analyses. He's also the author of a recently published report, 
with the Wilson Center's Kennan Institute, which I have right here and is also up on, on the screen. Uh, and it's called, of course, U.S.-Kazakhstan Relations at 30, Eurasian Security and Prosperity, which helped inspire this very event. I'd like to have Dr. Bakari come up here and say a few words about his report's findings and analytical observations before we turn to the panel. Dr. Bakari. So. Great, that's perfect. Everybody can hear me? Cool. All right. Well, thank you so much, Caroline. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I want to thank all my co panelists for agreeing to do this uh, in the middle of August when this town uh, is not very active. So thanks to everybody. Um, the, this report has been strange, to say the least, in, in the making. Um, I, its first iteration was finished in last July. Uh, and I thought, OK, you know, it's all good now. I'm done. And now comes the editing. But then the Taliban took over Afghanistan. And I could not publish a report that deals with Central Asia without factoring in what is going to come uh, from a Talibanized Afghanistan, from a post-American Afghanistan? How will that shape Central Asia? Uh, so, you know, and it, it, it wasn't something that I could just sort of note and move on. It needed some time to sort of process what's going on. It wasn't really clear. By the time I was done, and we were, it was at the end of the year, and I thought, okay, now I'm done. Um, then we had the uprising in early January in Kazakhstan itself. And that was far more of a game changer for my report uh, than the Taliban takeover. Uh, so I thought, okay, you know, let's, let's sit on this and see what happens. Uh, fortunately, the uprising was, you know, didn't last long and normalcy was restored. And I thought, okay, now I'm gonna get this report done. And then Putin invaded Ukraine. Uh, and again, I have to factor that in if I'm talking strategically about U.S.-Kazakhstan relations. You just can't ignore what's happening with Russia, considering that Russia is, is such a major player with regards to Kazakhstan. Uh, you know, I don't know how many of you know, but the two countries share something like 4,750 miles of a border. It's huge. That's a much larger than the U.S.-Canada border. Uh, just put it in perspective. So finally it got done. And the reason why I wrote this report uh, was because I wanted to understand what happened to U.S.-Kazakhstan relations. Because in the first decade post-independence, the relationship was very strong. Uh, there was a lot of activity. And of course, you know, it had to do with the U.S. assistance in developing Kazakhstan's energy sector, particularly the export capability of crude oil. But also, more importantly, the denuclearization and, and, and uh, Kazakhstan uh, you know, joining the NPT. And Kazakhstan, as a former Soviet republic, had a you know, large number of assets, probably the largest testing ground of the former Soviet Union. Uh, so there was that robust relationship. But then, of course, 9-11 happened, and the US essentially Put it mildly, its foreign policy, its strategic focus on the world got really skewed to a narrow geography with roughly from Middle East to South Asia, of course, with aspects of Central Asia, but this was sort of the center of gravity. Um, and now I wanted to understand, is there room for U.S.-Kazakhstan relations to improve and substantially, or at least go back to the robust engagement that we saw in the first decade? The reason why I was trying to understand this is because I really think that Central Asia uh, is going to be uh, very, very significant in the years ahead. It's already very significant considering the, uh, the, the center of gravity uh, of U.S. strategic interests. This is an area that, that China is playing in. This is an area that Russia does not want to give up, uh, either to China, definitely not to the United States. The United States has a very light footprint for obvious reasons, and, but because it's an area that's in the middle of the world, and, and my, one of my favorite authors, the, the great Halford McKinder, uh, who basically is the, uh, he conceived of the heartland theory, that whoever controls Eurasia, and the heartland being Central Asia, 
you know, has a dominant position in the world, can manage the world uh, better than those who don't. So for the United States as a superpower, I think this is one of the areas it needs to focus on. So my report basically says that the, the Kazakhstan, while the United States has been distracted, Kazakhstan has gone through an evolution. It has developed itself at a social level, at you know, an economic level, at a diplomatic level, and could be a robust partner for the United States. And that's sort of the key argument that I make in this report. I'm going to stop right here so that we can continue with the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bakari. And I was chatting a bit with the panelists before this, and I, it really was wonderful how all remarked that in this moment, too, um, you know, during the summer, during August, uh, we're seeing a lot of developments in the region that reflect the region's importance, and also, of course, this bilateral relationship with Kazakhstan. Um, so I want to start off, of course, with Ms. Todd. Uh, the elephant of room, of course, has been the post-withdrawal security landscape in Afghanistan, um, and how this really does relate to U.S. policy in Central Asia. Uh, so how can the United States uh, while it is, of course, looking at this challenge to integrate Afghanistan and a policy there into its Central Asia policy, while not also letting a focus on the Taliban in a humanitarian crisis eclipse its other regional priorities. How is the United States seeking to create greater capacity in this region and how they utilize that relationship with Kazakhstan in order to do so? Um, so first of all, thank you to Dr. Bakari, also New Lines, at this time to be discussing. Um, I also just want to preface all of my remarks by saying that these are my own personal views, not the views of the Department of Defense, the National Defense University, or Georgetown University. Got to get that disclaimer out there up front. Um, to your question, Caroline, about how the US can seek to create greater capacity at this time. I think one of the criticisms of the US is kind of how much we have been focused on Afghanistan over the last 20 years, uh, and how that has factored into our strategy towards Central Asia. I think certainly that was a factor, but it was not the only factor. Uh, I work very much in the realm of security and defense, and if you look at the growth of our bilateral and multilateral security cooperation with the region over the last 20 to 30 years, it's been really remarkable. It's both growth on the part of our partners in Central Asia, and specifically in this case, Kazakhstan, which I think has one of the most professional militaries in the region, but also the amount of investment that has gone into the relationship on both sides, um, whether that's financial investment, but also the time and energy and dedication to things like military reforms, when you look at the state of the militaries in the early 90s and kind of what they were like coming out of the, the Soviet period, I mean, essentially, you had five countries trying to create militaries from scratch based on what was left from the remnants of the Soviet military and a lot of the personnel and equipment that was left in the region following the collapse of the Soviet Union. Where we're at today, 30, day, or 30 years later, is quite remarkable. Um, and that's, that's been as the result of a lot of investment. So I think what we're focused on today is where we can continue to capitalize on some of the growth and some of the progress that has been made. Uh, for example, the United States, we're very much invested in things like professional military education. That's bringing officers from Central Asia to the United States, to our institutions, uh, to learn about our system and how our military functions but also sending US officers to Central Asia, to Kazakhstan, to learn more about their militaries. Um, you know, we use terms like interoperability. I don't know that we'll ever achieve full interoperability, but I think just gaining a greater understanding of how each respective military works and how we can work together, I think is, is great progress. Um, some of the other things that we're looking to build capacity in, uh, border security, counterterrorism, uh, you mentioned the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Certainly, uh, I think that the region continues to feel under threat from some of the, the things that are emanating from Afghanistan. 
Uh, and we are very conscious of that. We are continuing, I think, to factor that into our relationships and how we can continue to work together with the militaries in Central Asia, and in this case, specifically with Kazakhstan. I'll pause there. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Uh, I have a question for uh, Dr. Asanova, uh, and of course this is another very key element of, of this bilateral relationship and something that has been, of course, a uh, U.S. priority. And it is, of course, been the war in Ukraine, Russia's ongoing intervention there, and how, of course, U.S. policymakers have raised concerns about the role of Kazakhstan and other Central Asian states um, in their approach to sanctions against Russia. What should the United States approach be as Kazakhstan navigates its continuing deep economic relationship with Russia, but then also, of course, navigating that multi-vector foreign policy agenda? Uh, how do you think the United States should approach this when it comes to Kazakhstan and, and Russia? Uh, Kazakhstan is already, has already made a uh, uh, transition to adapt to this uh, sanctions policy against Russia. Um, and it, to some extent to take advantage of it. Kazakhstan is offering uh, registration to companies that are leaving Russia at the uh, Astana Financials, International Financial Center. They are um, uh, allowing those companies to function in Kazakhstan and not to have their business interrupted. But this is the least uh, that, uh, that is happening. Um, uh, this is necessary adaptation. There is no way when you have a country next door a big trade partner being sanctioned to continue to have normal trade relations. They had to, they had to be changed and certain goods cannot go to, to Russia because um, of the sanctions and certain limitations have to be put in place. At some point, the uh, economy of Kazakhstan was suffering from the fact that Russia was uh, giving a lot of money to a lot of companies that were selling cheaper goods to, to Kazakhstan. Um, and uh, that had to be regulated one way or another. So there have been uh, shifts in policy uh, to a large extent in, in the economy, and that's going to continue. But I would say that the shifts and the, the inflection point is reaching a lot more uh, than economy. It's reaching also energy. Uh, the CPC pipeline has been suspended three times. Um, uh, for various reasons. Um, it's not really uh, being used um, as much as it should be. It exports 80% of Kazakhstan's oil, and it all goes to Russia, and uh, from uh, Kazakhstan to Russia, and then to the Black Sea to be exported to global markets. So how do you make sure that when you have a huge energy industry, your uh, goods, your oil is, is going to the, to the global markets without uh, ch making changes. And the president of Kazakhstan already announced uh, that Kazakhstan is going to be looking for other ways to ship oil. Uh, for example, one of the ways is through the Caspian Sea to Azerbaijan and then through bakut bilisi jehan pipeline that goes uh, to the Mediterranean bypassing the Bosphorus, the uh, Turkish Straits. Um, but energy is a very, very big uh, factor in Kazakhstan economy, and this is why it's so important that uh, Kazakhstan secures alternative energy routes. But we have here a security uh, dimension that was changed by the war in Ukraine. Uh, Kazakhstan is planning to work with NATO and to cooperate with China as well, because China is next door and there is no way to build a new security architecture without uh, somehow including or cooperating with China. But this is a very big shift from CSTO, the Collective Security Treaty Organization, in the past relying on Russia for security arrangements. Now we're seeing uh, a change that might lead to even deeper transformation of the region. Um, I mentioned uh, economy, trade, and uh, energy, but there is also the transportation corridors that um, cannot go through Russia the way they used to go before. There are many risks associated with that. So they have to find another way. A lot of uh, the goods are going through the, uh, through the Caucasus now, through the so-called middle road, which is developing as a transportation corridor. But uh, how the United States can assist in, in all these efforts, it is very important to have diplomatic and uh, support and uh, deep engagement with Kazakhstan at every level. Kazakhstan was 
important country to the United States. The cooperation has been very good for many, many years due to both sides realizing how important, how big, how central Kazakhstan has been in the region. But the relationship has always given priority to Russia. It, the same is true about Ukraine. The same is true about any of the former Soviet republics. And now it's time to go from the periphery, from a country that was coming out of the Soviet Union, very important, will support it to priority. And uh, in that respect, I would say that United States support for deepening and making stronger the independence of, of Kazakhstan, support to build democratic institutions, support to, um, to uphold the rule of law, support in anti-corruption efforts. All this is going to be absolutely critically important for the region, for Kazakhstan, and for U.S.-Kazakhstan relationship. Thank you. And Ms. Curtis, I, I want to shift a bit to the diplomatic role that Kazakhstan could possibly play, not only in, in regional disputes and, and issues, but also on the international stage. And it's interesting, the Astana process is an example of this, how Kazakhstan is trying to uh, position itself and uh, showcase its capacity to be a sophisticated player in international diplomacy. And looking towards to Afghanistan, to South Asia, uh, to the international stage, how do you think the United States and Kazakhstan could work together, or how could the United States encourage Kazakhstan to play this intermediary diplomatic role um, in, in regional and international disputes? Do you see capacity there? Do you see uh, you know, a potential for, for a robust bilateral relationship on this, on this matter? Great, thank you. Uh, thanks to the New Lines Institute for inviting me here today. Congratulations to Kamran on a, a truly excellent report. Um, I hope all of you will have the chance to go through it uh, because it's well worth it. Um, and I think it is important to bring more attention to the U.S.-Kazakhstan relationship and to Central Asia more broadly. Um, unfortunately, I think this region doesn't get the attention it deserves. And we do need to, to focus more on it. When I was um, senior director of the National Security Council from 2017 to 2021, uh, the concern was that you know, too much attention was on Afghanistan or that we only saw Central Asia through the Afghanistan lens. Um, I think that concern is uh, fading now that the US has withdrawn from Afghanistan. I, I, we're not going to be looking at the region through uh, the Afghanistan lens. Um, I, I don't think that's the challenge, um, but I think simply the challenge is that the U.S. is pulled in so many different directions that we may forget that Central Asia lies at this crossroads um, uh, geostrategic location, um, and Kazakhstan in particular, bordering China and Russia, um, and being close to Afghanistan um, and would be impacted by any extremism or terrorism that would spill over Afghanistan's border into other uh, countries in Central Asia. Um, I did want to point out that uh, when I was at the NSC, uh, we did uh, take the time to do a sort of full-on Central Asia strategy, which uh, was uh, from 2019 through 2025. Um, and uh, I understand uh, from my discussion with Rihanna that they may be looking at uh, revising that or updating that, which probably is called for given all of the changes that we have seen in the last uh, year, year and a half. Um, but at that time, sort of the, the uh, principles of that strategy were, of course, you know, the guiding principle that the U.S. supports the sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity of the nation states of Central Asia, um, and that each nation should have a variety of partners from which they can choose and have options to pursue their own national interests. I think that's fundamentally important and has become even more so since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, next is supporting a, a strong region, supporting strong uh, intra-regional cooperation trade, connectivity, um, the region uh, adopting common political positions. Um, I think you know, the, the 
belief was that this will strengthen the region's independence. So not only are we strengthening the individual countries in the region, but the region as a whole. And that this is a, a good thing. Uh, at the time, we were really focused on building the capacity for counterterrorism in each of the Central Asian nation states, particularly Tajikistan um, uh, and Uzbekistan. But, um, but I think that has also become even more important with the uh, Afghanistan falling under the Taliban rule. Uh, we saw with the uh, elimination of Zawahiri that the Taliban still maintains its links to Al-Qaeda. Um, of course, it was being sheltered by a senior Taliban leader, uh, Suraj Khani, the interior minister. Um, so that is another area that we need to continue focusing on. And you, know, you asked about the uh, sort of leadership of Kazakhstan. And here I would point to what they did immediately following the collapse of the Afghan regime, uh, which was to allow UN staff to carry um, back and forth uh, humanitarian workers and aid supplies from Almaty to Kabul. Uh, they also made sure that we was going in uh, you know, meeting the humanitarian needs of the Afghan people. Um, so I do think there, there is a role uh, for Kazakhstan in the future of Afghanistan. I know that Kazakhstan was very committed to supporting women and girls' rights um, and wanted to continue those opportunities for education. Unfortunately, uh, what we have seen is the Taliban has uh, moved backward and is becoming increasingly repressive toward women, uh, not allowing girls to attend high school. So there hasn't been a lot of room, I think, to, to continue that dialogue um, with Kazakhstan and educating Afghan girls. But I know they, they stand ready to help um, in, in that regard in the future. So I think if, if um, we can try to work more closely with Kazakhstan, particularly on the human rights, women's rights issues, that would be important. But frankly, it's, it's going to take a lot more than just you know, working with Kazakhstan. The US um, has lost a great deal of its influence in Afghanistan. It's going to have to work with multiple partners, whether in Europe, et cetera. But Central Asia is uh, certainly part of that overall uh, calculus. Um, so I guess uh, you know, your, your question, I, I, I think some, uh, Kazakhstan has played an extremely important role you know, in the Syria talks, as you mentioned, uh, the fuel bank uh, issue, uh, and uh, will continue to be a, you know, a positive force uh, within you know, the major issues that are, are facing the international community. Um, and so I think it will continue to serve that purpose. Um, but right now, I think what the US is really looking for uh, from Kazakhstan is to stand firm in the face of growing Russian hegemony, uh, as well as Chinese uh, hegemony. And I think it, it, given we're seeing increasing aggressive, increasingly aggressive policies from both Russia and China, because now they've come together in this no limits uh, partnership that was announced in February. Um, you know, the importance of the US Kazakhstan relationship is, is even, even more so. It's really, really important that we continue uh, to understand the dynamics. Of course, Kazakhstan is balancing uh, this uh, relationship with Russia with their own concerns about their own territorial sovereignty, having the 4,000 mile or so border with Russia, having a large ethnic Russian population in northern Kazakhstan. So they have to balance all that. And I think the US uh, understands uh, that. Um, but they also, I think, at the same time, want the US presence. Um, they understand how important it is to have US involvement in the region uh, so that they do have more choices. Absolutely. You hit on a few elements uh, for a question I would like to also pose to um, uh, Mr. Chazovsky uh, regarding China and also this concept of interconnectivity, which is something that you've been working on quite a lot recently. And Central Asia is a really interesting case for this, 
We have, of course, uh, China's ongoing, uh, yes, I think if we use that one mic, by the way, uh, this one seems to be muted or dead, so we can just pass that one across. Um, of course, we have uh, an expansionist China in the region. They are promoting a lot of infrastructural and economic projects. And uh, the United States, of course, there is the proposed blue dot strategy, but again, there's a lot left uh, to, to be built and, and to uh, be announced to counter Chinese influence. How do you see the landscape of interconnectivity in Central Asia, and specifically with this bilateral relationship with Kazakhstan? How can the United States promote greater regional connectivity, and how can they use this as a tool and as a key element of this bilateral relationship? Sure. Thank you, Caroline. Um, so my distinguished uh, fellow panelists have already laid out in great detail a lot of the challenges uh, that Kazakhstan faces and that the U.S. faces in its relationship with Kazakhstan uh, kind of throughout the region. Um, and I think, you know, to, to address your question on connectivity, I, I do agree that that's a really important element here, uh, not only in Kazakhstan, but in Central Asia more broadly. So China has obviously played a very important role and an increasingly important role over the past decade or so with its Belt and Road Initiative uh, investing a lot of money into transport projects, a lot of infrastructure projects, uh, and that's really given China, you know, a, a footprint, if you will, in, in Central Asia. One that, by the way, translates not only in the economic sphere, but also into security as well, albeit not to the same extent that Russia has in terms of its uh, security presence um, in Kazakhstan and in Central Asia. So I think um, it, it's really important for the U.S. that it's not going to be able to, or uh, nor should it be uh, willing to kind of compete with uh, the likes of China and Russia on the same footing that they're doing. Um, and I think there's a few different reasons for that. Um, you know, first of all, for, from Russia's perspective and, and also for China, these countries are in the region, so to speak. They both have borders with Kazakhstan. Uh, and so their ability to, to field, whether that be energy projects or even security deployments, as we saw you know, in the case of, of Russia uh, early this year, it, it, the U.S. just doesn't have the, the capacity uh, nor the willingness to do something like that. Um, also, the amounts that uh, China has invested economically in, you know, whether that's oil or natural gas pipelines, that also is something that the U.S., I don't think is um, you know, in a position to do. But here I think it's important to distinguish what the US can do. And it's really to uh, kind of separate itself from the likes of Russia and China and pursue, uh, I would argue, for a more uh, constructive and strategic form of connectivity that really plays into US strengths. And actually is, as you mentioned, Caroline, whether that's the Blue Dot Network or the Biden administration's uh, Build Back Better World initiative or, or really any of these kinds of major global initiatives that we can expect to see um, in the coming years to compete with the likes of China and Russia, but in a way that does so that feeds into the U.S. strengths. So whether that's, you know, pursuing green energy projects, whether that's pursuing gender equity projects, or even some sustainable or high-tech infrastructure projects to tackle climate change. I think this is the kind of thing uh, that would be beneficial for the U.S. to pursue, and it is to, you know, to a certain extent pursuing that, but kind of looking at that from a more strategic and all of government approach. And this I think will play into a lot of the challenges that Kazakhstan faces. As we've discussed in this panel, you know, Kazakhstan, it has a close relationship with Russia, obviously as a uh, Eurasian Economic Union member, as a CSTO member. We've seen the growing uh, economic ties um, with, with China, but Kazakhstan is trying to pursue a multi-vectoral foreign policy, as, as Kamran mentioned, it went into detail in his report. And I think that's become even more important in this current geopolitical context with you know, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, obviously having an impact on Kazakhstan, some of it positive, but a lot of it negative. And so I think the more that Kazakhstan is able to pursue this multi-vectoral foreign policy and the U.S. can help it do so, the better that the region will be able to be to con confront its many challenges. Absolutely. And uh, Dr. Rakari, I'd, I'd like to also ask you about a point that you make uh, pretty early in the report regarding the three major challenges that intersect in Kazakhstan and pose a series of strategic crosswinds. Uh, one, of course, is a Talibanized Afghanistan, an expansionist China, and an aggressive Russia. And you talk about this potential for violent overspill 
and an expanded strategic vacuum in the region, resulting in Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, which could affect Kazakh security, human security, uh, and create a greater incentive for strategic cooperation. How do you see this trajectory looking ahead? What, what do you see is down the road for Kazakhstan? And of course, where are the blind spots that the United States can address and, and cooperate with Kazakhstan on? Thank you, Caroline. I, I think I'll begin with what Lisa mentioned uh, about uh, intra-regional uh, cooperation. Uh, I think there is a need, Kazakhstan being sort of the largest and most prosperous nation in the region, um, can, can play a leading role, and of course, a, a more cooperative in, in the sense that uh, with a country like Uzbekistan, um, Tajikistan and Turkmenistan are, are a bit more fragile, let me say, far more fragile than, the, uh, than Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, and then Kyrgyzstan is sort of in between. It's a country that has had three political uprisings. The point that I'm making is that this region is in transition, uh, and even before we get into the, you know, the, the strategic crosswinds that are at, you know, blowing from Russia and China and uh, from this post-American Afghanistan. And I would also add that uh, we shouldn't sort of, they're not at the same level as the, the actors, but we should not uh, ignore what Turkey is doing or Iran, and I would even extend it to India. Uh, and and I, I'd be happy to get into those, but for the purposes of your question, uh, these are countries that are evolving. So we're like 30 years out from uh, you know, the immediate post-Soviet era. Uh, we're seeing uh, regime evolution uh, and, and on different sort of wavelengths and frequencies in, in all countries. So we've just, for, for example, Turkmenistan has just had uh, the son of the former president, uh, you know, Gurban Bar Bardi Mohammadov, take over, uh, the junior uh, Mohammadov, Sardar Mohammadov, he's taken over. He's passed the torch to, uh, the, sorry, the baton to his, uh, his son. So there's, that's a new beginning, and, and any time you have sort of leadership change, there are vulnerabilities, there are questions whether, you know, the new leadership will be able to hold things together in, in a place that's very autocratic, very closed off. Turkmenistan is one of those very closed off countries uh, in the world. Uh, we, we know, f I mean, I guess it's because of the Arab Spring, but there was a time when Syria was a very closed off place to the rest of the world. North Korea is a closed off place, but Turkmenistan, uh, we don't wonder about it, but I think, it, again, you know, it, it, it bears more uh, focus and attention. So let's just give you one example. Uh, we don't know what effect would this new government in Afghanistan will have on the security and stability of Tajikistan. Uh, so with Russia, uh, focused on its strategic front yard, which is Ukraine. Uh, the question is, how much bandwidth does it have to focus on a place like Tajikistan that still has about 7,000 troops from Russia? Um, and how, where is it in its priority uh, list? Uh, yes, President Putin made that trip recently to Tajikistan to basically showcase, yes, I can you know, walk and chew gum together, I can fight a war in Ukraine, and focus on, uh, you know, our near abroad, uh, like nothing happened. Uh, but reality is that there are limited resources. And then China is trying to take advantage while China and Russia collaborate in terms of trying to, uh, in, with respect to the United States. Uh, but they're pursuing their own interests. Uh, with a receding Russian footprint in Central Asia, China is trying to take advantage of that, and, and through its BRI, through its investment, uh, Daniel Markey over at uh, USIP has written a fascinating book a couple of years ago on, on China's push into Eurasia. I would urge all of you to read it if you haven't already. Uh, China, this is where China is putting a lot of emphasis on. Uh, there's a reason, and, and Caroline uh, wrote a fantastic uh, assessment for us last year, uh, on why is it that the Chinese are putting so much time and energy uh, with respect to the suppression of the weaker minority? Is it just cultural erasure? Is it just sort of, uh, if you will, assimilation of a people that are distinct from the core Han Chinese and, and, and religiously distinct? Um, you know, we are, Caroline argued in that piece, and, and 
rightfully so, and I agree with her, that it's more about Central Asia. You cannot push into Central Asia if you have to turn around and keep your, you know, one eye over your shoulder and make sure that Xinjiang is still, you know, with you. So these, these are all vulnerabilities, but this is why China is, is uh, pushing hard. There's, um, you know, this fascinating debate that, you know, is Chinese focus on the, you know, what we call the, now called the Indo-Pacific Basin? Uh, the events of the last week or two certainly suggest that, yes, they're focusing on Taiwan and far more than ever before, uh, but they're also focusing on, on land. And I would argue that it'll be time before China becomes a maritime power, it, but it is a land power. And, and, it's, and, and, and they know how to do transportation corridors, they build it through Pakistan, although it hasn't panned out the way they had expected. They did the same thing with Myanmar. Uh, but nonetheless, they are pushing. So in this atmosphere, I think that it's important that we go back to, and, and Lisa mentioned it, uh, that we need to build capacity of these states. Margarita's talked about uh, the democratization, building the, the democratic institutions, rule of law, building capacity, resilience of these countries so that they can deal with their natural evolution while everything else around them seems to be, you know, falling on them or, or you know, coming down on them like a, a wall of bricks. Uh, but, you know, this is, this is the reality of the region. And we don't know where these things will, will go. Uh, and we have to keep an eye on, uh, on multiple actors. So, and, and this is a region that the United States has the lightest footprint on the, on the planet. So I think there, there's a, a, a lot here that we need to pay attention to and get up to speed on. Uh, and, and that's why I think the focus, we need to think of Central Asia far more strategically than just another region where we should have better relations. So I had another round of questions. However, I know that we're a bit tight for time and I really do want to leave some space for audience questions. Uh, so I'm going to take that mic and uh, we, can, we can pass it around for those who have questions. Are there any questions for our panelists today? If not, I, I, can, go, I can go straight into the other questions that I had. Uh, please raise your hand if, if you do, more than happy to, to offer the chance to pose questions. Yes. Sure, and thank you so much everybody for, for joining us today. My name is Alex Worth. I work with the Center for European Policy Analysis. Uh, I think that sort of one thing that I kind of took away from a lot of the discussion that you had is that there's been these big changes in the region, but a lot of them are trends that maybe were already sort of predictable prior to the past several months, right? A waning American influence in Afghanistan, a further isolated and belligerent Russia, a growing influence of China, uh, this might be a broad question, but do you think that there are things that the United States was getting wrong about the region prior to these shifts that need to change now that these trends are accelerating? Or I guess we talk about sort of expanding our presence there, but what exactly are the strategic shifts that we're hoping to make in our approach to the region? Thank you. This is a very good question. I wanted to uh, mention earlier the biggest challenge to the region that we are facing now with the war in Ukraine. The war has been already a strategic loss for Russia, and it's about to become a military loss. It's already military loss. It may become, become full military loss for Russia. What does that mean for the rest of the countries? Russia is going to be a much weaker country. The sanctions on Russia need to continue until certain conditions are met. Withdrawing troops from, Afghanistan, from uh, Ukraine is one. The other one is uh, reparations, and the third one is war, war crimes uh, to be prosecuted. So these are the, the three minimum things, the major things that need to happen. Uh, at the same time, and we neglect that, and I don't think that we are thinking very seriously about that, the processes within Russia. Is Russia going to stay that empire that it is now, is it going to start disintegrating? Is it going to rupture? What kind of rupture we, we can expect? 
It's certainly going to be much more violent than the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And this is going to affect the neighboring countries more than anything that has happened in the last 30 years. And I think that this is the main topic that needs to be discussed in policy circles now. Preparation for the rupture of Russia. Jamestown just published the book of Janusz Bugajski called Failed State, um, a guidebook to Russia's rupture. And that book was written before the war. It was just a month before the war. And the processes were already there in Russia. And they are only going to deepen. And most importantly, they are going to be sped up by the war in, in Ukraine. So with this huge border that Kazakhstan has with Russia, with a Russian minority that still, um, it's under 20% now, it used to be, Kazakh Kazakhs used to be minority in their own country uh, 30 years ago. Now they have grown as population, the Russian minority is much smaller. But still we're talking here about close to 18, 20% of Russian minority. It's a huge, huge number for any country to have more than 10% minority. It always creates and could create the uh, problems on the ethnic level, particularly with the Kazakhs opposing the war in Ukraine and with many Russians supporting it. So this is another factor that is extremely important for the United States to pay attention what is going to happen internally in Kazakhstan and what is going to happen in Kazakhstan as a result of Russia's rupture. Russia might be weak, but it still has the ability to stage provocations. And we see this in the Balkans, and we are going. To, we see this in Georgia. Georgia just uh, announced it's going to withdraw its application for membership in NATO. When we can see this in in, uh, in Central Asia as well, are we prepared for that? I think the thinking level at the moment is the most important. How the United States government is going to prepare for something that is a, is a, is about to happen? It is going to happen sooner or later. Are we going to support Russia to maintain itself as a federation? Are we going to support the newly independent states that could emerge within Russia? Are we going to make the previous mistake that we made during the dissolution of the Soviet Union, trying to keep it together at the beginning instead of really giving the necessary support to the newly independent states so that they can be strong uh, and that way uh, curb Russia's resurgence in the future? I think that Ms. Curtis also had a response as well, if we could pass the mic. Yeah, just quickly following up on that very good response from Marguerite, one of the issues is um, dependence on Russia for oil exports. Um, and you know, we know that President Takayev is starting to recognize that Kazakhstan has been uh, probably too dependent on Russia for exporting its oil. Uh, the CPC, or uh, Caspian Pipeline Consortium, this is the pipeline that in 2021 transported about 1.3 million barrels per day of Kazakh crude through Russia. Um, so there is a vulnerability there, um, and it's, it's, it's probably not the best long-term option for Kazakhstan. So I think the U.S. can do more to encourage the development of Caspian energy reserves and tra trans-Caspian energy corridors that link Central Asia, the Caucasus, and Europe. Um, so this is something that I think does need more attention. Um, you know, it's a longer term issue, but there should be more focus um, in the United States on this issue. And just quickly, if you're talking about things the U.S didn't predict, I think we can safely say, the protests that took place in January. In fact, I was in Kazakhstan in November and just no signs at all that we would have that level of uh, protest and violence um, in the country. So I think that, that was a big surprise. And I'll just mention here that um, you know, there is concern in the United States um, about you know, the, the uh, thousands of people who were arrested, uh, remain detained, uh, particularly uh, high-level officials such as the National Security Committee chairman and former two-time Prime Minister Karim Masimov, uh, who has been arbitrarily de detained ever since uh, January 8th. Um, and I think it's, it's uh, incumbent on the U.S. to insist that due process of law is followed uh, for his case was an important interlocutor for the United States. And during his tenure in office uh, as uh, prime minister, 
relations between the U.S. and Kazakhstan uh, were greatly improved. And my understanding is that the U.N. Working Group on Arbitrary Detentions will consider uh, Mr. Masimov's case at the 94th session in August. So I think it's important not only for U.S. officials but also members of Congress uh, to, to make it known that his case is being watched very closely. Thank you. Ms. Todd, I also think you have a response. Just one quick comment for consideration, and this isn't necessarily something that only applies to the United States. I think it also applies to Russia and China in this case, and that is we are approaching this from the perspective of our own countries and not necessarily from the perspective of Kazakhstan or any of the countries in Central Asia. In terms of these are independent sovereign states with their own agency, and when we talk about things like increasing engagement or doing more, we oftentimes look at it from what we want, but not necessarily what they want. And so I think it's important to keep in mind that there are a multitude of partners that are currently interested in Central Asia. Kamran mentioned Turkey, Iran, India. I would also throw in a lot of the Gulf states, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, UAE. There are a lot of countries that are very interested in this region right now. So when we talk about increased engagement, I think that there are a lot of interested parties. And as a result, Kazakhstan and the neighbors in Central Asia have a lot of opportunities and it may not be the United States that is always chosen. So I think not necessarily something that we get wrong, but I think something we often overlook is we may not necessarily be you know, first among equals because there's so much competition. Do we have room for uh, one more question from the audience? If not, we can wrap up. But if there are any questions, I'm happy to pass the mic. No? No problem. Well, thank you so, so much for being with us today. Um, and of course, this excellent panel for a really great discussion on U.S.-Kazakh relations. And a very special thank you, of course, to our camera crew who came out here today uh, and our panelists who carved out the time and their very busy schedules to discuss this topic. It was a privilege and a, and a pleasure to moderate this discussion with you all. Please note that this discussion has been recorded and will be uploaded to New Lines Institute's YouTube page as well as its website, where you can find it at www.newlinesinstitute.org. Thank you once again for joining us here today, and please have a wonderful rest of your week.